I would like to introduce uh, Professor Amichai Mazar Ami, uh, one of the leading, one of the best uh, archaeologists in Israel, uh, one of the best specialists on the uh, biblical period uh, in the land of Israel. So it is a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce Ami Mazar. And uh, Professor Mazar, it's all yours. Thank you, Yulia. <laughs> And it's wonderful to see all of you here in those little boxes. I'm at my home in Jerusalem after the second vaccine, so I feel safe. And uh, today I will uh, try to present to you results of archaeological work which we did during the last 20 years in the Bet Valley. You all have been in Israel and you probably know Bet She'an, the Bet She'an Valley. Uh, where Tel Bechan, the mound of Bechan, is overlooking the town and the Roman city. We excavated there between 1989 and 1996. And in fact, I remember now that we had several groups of Sarel with us working on this deep mound. And then we moved to another site, Tel Rehov, which will be at the focus of this uh, presentation. I'll try to show you uh, several uh, exciting remains, I think. Uh, from mainly the 10th and 9th centuries BCE, that means the time, the alleged time of David, Solomon, Ahab, um, and the rise of Jehu, of the house of Jehu, in biblical terms. This will be an archaeological lecture. I hope it will not be too boring. But I now must share my screen with my presentation. So let me see if it works out. Yeah. It should work because you are a co-host. It should work. It should work, but it you know, work. not always it works. I don't know where I am right now. It should also. I also had it allow multiple participants to, to share. Yeah, but how how do I find my uh, presentation? Oh my God, you're already sharing your screen. You already do that. Yeah, now but I don't see. I don't see in my screen what I need to see. That means the desktop. Okay. One moment. Okay, sure. Uh, one Somebody, moment. Uh, Sar El, here you are. All right. Sar El are. lecture. Wait. Okay. Here we are. One moment. In my age, all this technology is not so easy. All right. Can you see? Yes. 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 We see, see very well. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are talking about two sites, El Bechan and El Rejo. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and we should start with a map showing the land of Israel during the time of David and Solomon according to the biblical narrative, of course. You have to remember that there is a lot of debate, a very strong debate during the last 20 or 30 years concerning the historicity of the Davidic and Solomonic kingdom. But in almost every biblical atlas that you will find, you will see more or less this map showing the borders of the kingdom according to the description in the Old Testament. And um, I mean, even some will even draw this much theme, uh, map that's showing the Euphrates at the northern border of the Promised Land. Uh, as we know, in the Bible, David has some political alliance with the kingdom of Hamat in Syria. So in some atlases, some maps, you'll find the Davidic kingdom stretching all over Syria. But this is, of course, quite imaginary. Since the end of the 10th century, around 920, 925 BC, uh, we have the split kingdom, the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom in the north, with the capital first at Shechem, then at Tirza, and finally at Samaria, of course. This is the kingdom in its heyday, the ninth century, when the Omride dynasty, Ahab, conquers 
the large parts of Transjordan, Gilead, and the land of Moab, and of course the kingdom of Judah. There are also debates concerning the emergence of Judah, when exactly uh, Judah became an independent and important kingdom. On this background, we can now turn to this little corner south of the Sea of Galilee. Here you can see the northern part of Israel. Here is... Uh, uh, um, Mr. Mazar, what caused yes. the split between uh, north and south? Please. Mark, if you could please hold your questions or write them in the comments. That's sort of how we work it during these presentations. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so we are talking today only about the north, the north, northern Israel, which will not talk about Judah at all. And even here, I'm talking only about the northern part, the northern valleys, the valley of Jezreel, which you see here, with Megiddo, the main site, the valley of Bet She'an, here is the Lake of Galilee, Kinneret, Bet She'an, site of Bet She'an, and the new site which we started excavating in 1997, it was almost unknown in the archaeology of Israel. The site, was, the site itself was already known in, from the beginning of the 20th century, but no one excavated there. And it turned to be a very, very important site for the archaeology of the 10th and 9th centuries BCE, as you will see very soon. So Tel Rehov and Tel Bet She'an. Here you can see a satellite um, 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 uh, photograph showing the Lake of Galilee, the Kinneret, the Jordan Valley, the Gilboa Mountains here, the Valley of Harod, the edge of the Valley of Jezreel, the Valley of Bejan, and the mountains of Transjordan, the Gilead, as they are known in the Bible. Here we can see the Yarmouk and the Jordan River down here. The two sites, Bejan, El Rehov are here. The valley is very rich with water, a lot of springs, and therefore, and a lot of good land, fertile land, and therefore we find there dozens of archaeological sites. You can see here a map showing many archaeological sites that were uncovered, I mean, known from surveys. They were not excavated throughout the valley, about 50 of them. And the two sites which will interest us are here, Bet She'an and Rehov. Tel Bet a high, very steep mount overlooking the valley. You can see here on the left, the Roman city, <clears throat> um, Scytopolis, the Roman city that was excavated by the Israel Antiquities Authority and the Hebrew University. And up here on the mount, you can see the remains of the biblical city of Bet She'an. In fact, this mount hides about 20 levels Strata, you know that in those ancient mounds of Israel, uh, due to the fact that they always wanted to leave, to return to the same spot due to the geographical background, water, good land. So you can see the same uh, people coming and living and rebuilding their, their city and their settlement through uh, about, I would say, 5,000 years of settlement here. We start here about 5,000 BC and we end around the early Roman period up here on the mound. Uh, the most important period in the history of Bet She'an were the Canaanite period before the Israelites arrived to the land of Israel. This was a period of Egyptian domination, uh, the late Bronze Age, that means the 14th and 13th centuries, during which Bet She'an was an Egyptian stronghold, an Egyptian government center in northern Israel, uh, administrative center, where the Egyptians ruled the entire northern part of the country, the, the local Canaanite cities, continued to be important. It's mentioned in the Bible uh, several times. In the book of Judges, we read that Bet She'an and its region, as well as Megiddo and its region, and Tanakh and its region, continued to be Canaanite. They don't say until when, but it's very interesting to read this, to read Judges chapter one. Because when we excavate Bet She'an, when we excavate Tel Rehob, we can see a lot of continuity in the local Canaanite material culture, well, deep into the time of the monarchy, of the Israelite monarchy. So this source in Judges chapter one probably um, has some historical, true historical background. 
Another story is in the book of Samuel. Remember the war between the Israelites and the Philistines uh, on Mount Gilboa, under, led by King Saul. And King Saul is killed in this battle. The Philistines are said to bring his body to Bet She'an, and they hang the body of Saul on the walls of Bet She'an. The Israelites from Yavesh Gilad, from the city of Yavesh Gilad in Tanz Jordan, during the night, they come and they steal the body and bring it back to Yavesh Gilad where they burn it. Not only Saul, Saul and his two sons, according to the Bible. Now, here we have a lot of problems with this story because, first of all, the Philistines did not live in this area. The Philistines lived in Philistia, Ashkelon, Jodod, in the south, southern coastal plain. What are they doing here? We don't have any remains of Philistine culture found here in Beit She'an. We know very well from archaeology how the, how the Philistine culture looked like. We don't have anything of it here on El Beit She'an. And we don't have any walls, city walls were not found. Perhaps they were destroyed in this terrible um, um, erosion or the past on this mound. By the way, those of you who, are, who come from Philadelphia, this site was excavated between 1921 and 1927 by University Museum of uh, University of Philadelphia, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and I continued their work from 1989 uh, uh, until 1996. We have, we have a lot of information uh, on this site, El From the uh, period that I discuss now with you, the 10th and 9th centuries, we have very little El Bechan. Most of this period was excavated by our predecessors. Uh, the excavation results are not very well published. We don't know much. Uh, in my excavations, we managed to uncover remains of three major buildings. You can see some of them here from the late 10th or 9th centuries BC. Perhaps these were some kind of administrative building. They are quite uh, massive and they are overlooking the valley just on the edge of the mound. So I think that they had some importance in this period. But in fact, we don't know much about the Iron Age, about this period of the monarchy, very little. Therefore, I turned, because I was interested in this period, I turned to this site, El Rechov, an imposing site. I was completely surprised to find that this site is about uh, 10 hectares in area. This is not very large in terms of New York or Philadelphia, but it's very large in terms of ancient biblical towns, for example, Megiddo was only eight or nine uh, hectares. This is quite a large mound. You can see it looking east now. We can see the Gilead, the Transjordanian mount, uh, hills, and the Jordan River here in the center of this peak. We excavated in this area, in this site, a substantial, substantial number of excavated areas. You can see them here in red. So we have now a good information concerning the history of this site. But today we shall concentrate on this area, and perhaps we shall have time to speak a little bit about this area E. So area C, this will be our main target today. You can see it here. We are looking now south into the Jordan Valley. You can see the Jordan Valley here, and the, Gil the uh, Gilad, the Transjordanian mountains uh, here on the left. So we are excavating here. There is an upper mound and a lower mound. We excavated as usual when we start a new excavation in a new site, we start with a trench, a deep trench on the slope that you can compare it to a cake. You cut a slice in the cake to get an idea of what is there. And you can see here our slice. It is nine meters wide and we have here a sequence of levels, of occupation levels from the Canaanite period when this place was founded uh, in the 15th century until the 11th century, the period of the judges up here. So in fact, when you look on this section, you have to realize that we pass here from the Canaanite period through more or less the time of Joshua, the time of the judges, all the way to the time of Solomon and David up here, a period of about 500 years. But we shall not talk about this period today. I'll show you just, okay, here you can see those levels, those strata that we excavated. Just I'll show you one, one small piece of find that we found in this Canaanite city, an Ashtart. You remember in the Bible, uh, the Ashtart 
the fertility figurine which the Canaanite worship, the Canaanites worship. So we found two of them, the naked women. Look at this one, how stylized, how interesting is. Very unusual and very unique uh, clay figurine made of clay. But uh, today I'll speak mainly about the 10th and 9th centuries. And here we have several important discoveries which I want to share with you. You can see here a plan of three situations, the red, the green, and the blue. Each is one above the other. The earliest one is the red, the middle one is the green, and the uppermost one is the blue. This is how we work in archeological sites. We have stratification, we have layers. Again, you, you can compare it to a cake, a layer above a layer above a layer, a city that was destroyed and rebuilt, destroyed and rebuilt. So uh, this one is dated to the 10th century. You will ask me, how do you date those structures? So today we use a lot, in many cases, we use radiocarbon dating. We find um, olive pits or some grain, charred grain. We send it to laboratories and they can give us a date with a resolution of about 50 years plus minus. So the dates from this level are all in the 10th century. The dates from this level are end of 10th century, beginning of 9th century, around 900 BCE, that means the time of the division of the kingdom, the split of the kingdom, and the blue are from the time of the 9th century, that means the time of Ahab, more or less Omri and Ahab, let us say, until a final destruction, a total destruction of this city, which in my view occurred around 840 to 830 BCE, and uh, this was a conquest probably caused by a, by a military raid by Hazael, who we know from the Book of Kings, the king of Damascus, the Aramean king, who fought Israel, and um, his cruel conquests are well documented in the Bible. So I'll show you a few remains from the red one, exciting remains from the red, from the green level, and if we have some time, a few remains from the blue, which is very interesting, but I'm afraid that our time is short. Uh, this site is very interesting in terms of building technique. All the buildings are built of mud bricks uh, without stone foundation. It's why a very unique uh, te uh, building technique, and we still don't have a good explanation why we use this uh, method here. In the red city, the 10th century, we have houses, we have pottery, we have ovens like this one, regular material culture, you know, it's a city, definitely, because you can see the buildings are built one attached to the other, one attached to the other, nice, uh, well-planned structures. We didn't excavate, uh -oh, um, we didn't excavate complete, uh, almost not complete buildings because this is the earliest level uh, but you can see here one example and so on. I'll not get into details here. You can see the pottery. You can see that much of the pottery is red. It's covered with a red, what we call red slip, and it's highly burnished. This is a typical technique to the 10th century BC, the time of the so-called United Monarchy. We find it all over the country in the 10th century BC. It's a new technique, which is foreign to the Canaanite traditions. Also some painted pottery, in local Canaanite tradition. We were lucky in Tel Rehov to find several inscriptions, which are very rare. You have to understand that in this period, we have very few inscriptions in the land of Israel. I think all over the country, no more than 20, 25 inscriptions, very short ones. And this is a new inscription that we found from the 10th century BC, mentioning a guy called Mem Taf Aleph, Mata probably a man, meaning of this name. The letters, as you can see them here, this is a mem, for example. Think about your M today, which is a direct continuity from this mem. This is the Canaanite mem, the Canaanite M, <clears throat> which represents water, mime in Hebrew, the taf and the aleph. So this is a Canaanite script that is still used in the 10th century BCE. You can see the radiocarbon dates, you can see them here from this red city. They're all in the 10th century, between 1000 
in 900 BC, except this one. Okay. So during the time of the, ten, the during the 10th century, Tel Rehob was one of the largest cities in Israel. We don't have, in fact, many sites excavated and many sites where we have this urban culture throughout the 10th century. And there are two possibilities here. Either it was part of the Davidic Solomonic Kingdom, if you accept the historicity of this kingdom. But many scholars today think that there was no such kingdom. I'm not one of them. For them, Tel Rehov in the 10th century would be only a, a local city, a city state, I would say, with a local government for itself, not part of a kingdom, not part of a state of any sort in the 10th century. So there are, we have to take two narratives, two completely different narratives concerning the 10th century BC. Um, one that accepts the biblical paradigm, the biblical narrative, the framework, a large kingdom with its capital in Jerusalem. And the alternative one, we don't accept this narrative and uh, think in completely different terms concerning the history of the 10th century. One important document from the 10th century, in fact, the only written document that we have concerning the 10th century BCE is the famous Shoshenk or biblical Shishak, who is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of Kings, as raiding Jerusalem a few years after the death of Solomon during the time of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Uh, this was an Egyptian pharaoh, the only Egyptian pharaoh who left Egypt and invaded the land of Canaan, the land of Israel, in the period after the New Kingdom, after the, the Late Bronze Age. The date is around 920 BCE. And we have his inscription on the walls of the Temple of Amun at Karnak in Egypt, a huge temple in Egypt. And this wall uh, inscription that you see here is about, I think, eight or 10 meters tall. It's a huge inscription. And it mentions names, names, each name in a frame, what we call cartouche, a name of a city, of a town in the land of Israel. We have here about 120 names. Many of them are Hebrew names, like Arad, for example, places which are known from the Bible. Even the name Abraham, Ab Abraham is mentioned here. Uh, so he really knew what he's doing. And we can see the map here, the arrows, which show the route. There were two parts to this raid. The northern one went going all the way near Jerusalem, crossing the central mountains. That means the heartland of Israel going down to the Jordan Valley. He mentions several places here in the Jordan Valley. And then he mentions Rehov and Bet Sha'an. The two sites that I mentioned in this lecture are mentioned in this inscription. And then he continues to Megiddo, he mentions Tanakh, Megiddo, and returns to Egypt. There was also a southern route, which is not in our scope. They to the Negev, to the desert. Why did Shoshek, why the Egyptian army invaded the land of Israel in that time, we don't really know the purpose, the goal. Uh, some think that it is related to the copper industry in the Jordan, in the Araba Valley in that time, but that's, this needs a different lecture. So we turn to the red city. Then end of 10th century, probably after Shoshenk, I think so. And here I want to show you, first of all, you can see that the city is very well planned, well planned city, a lot of houses built one next to the other. You can see it from the air here. But I want to show you one very unusual and interesting discovery, which we made here in this corner here. First, a building technique, you can see a lot of wood in the foundations of structures. But the discovery that I want to show you here is really unique was not found in any other site in the ancient Near East, even not in Greece or Rome. This is an ancient apiary. An apiary is an English word which I didn't even know until 2005, but it so happens that I discovered the first apiary or beehives anywhere in the ancient Near East. What we found here is 
cylinders made of clay, made of mud, in fact. You can see here one cylinder and a second cylinder, third one and the fourth one. Here is my collaborator, Nava Panitz Cohen. He was born in Brooklyn and became a very famous Israeli archaeologist. You can see here the, the, the cylinders of clay, which she is now cleaning. They were preserved miraculously due to a heavy destruction. You can see the destruction, the fallen debris above those cylinders. At first, we didn't know what they are. What are they? And then I realized that I, I saw something similar. And I had a feeling that I saw them in a museum that shows typical Arab beehives. And in fact, a, here you can see a, the season later in 2007, we uncovered 30 of them. One line, second line, a, and a third line. And you can see here the three lines of those cylinders. You can see the drawing of how, what exactly we found. Uh, the, the details of each apiary, each one of them, each beehive, has one side with a small, narrow hole where the bees could fly in and out. It's a flying hole. And on the other side, there was a lid with a handle that could be opened in order to extract uh, honeycombs. Now, how did we know that these are beehives indeed? First, we conducted chemical analysis. And a scholar from the Weizmann Institute, who just finished her PhD exactly on this subject, um, conducted chemical analysis and she showed us that those walls, those clay walls, include um, uh, some remains of honey um, um, uh, wax, of a bee wax. Moleculus, molecules of um, bee wax were found here in this, inside these walls. But even more exciting was the fact that we found the bees themselves, as you will see soon. Here you can see a reconstruction of an artist, how those, this apiary looked like. It's very industrial, it's very well planned. You can see that people took care to build a very nice, very well planned apiary. There were three tiers, one, two, three, one on top of the other. We found remains of all three of them. And the interesting point is that this apiary, which could include something like 2 million bees, perhaps, according to calculation that we made, is inside the city. It's not outside the city. Usually, you locate your hives outside the city. How come? For what reason? Not only that, we found evidence for some religious practices that were carried out. Uh, next to this apiary. This is an altar made of clay, made of pottery. You can see on the altar, the altar has horns. You remember the horns of the altar in the Bible. The killer, if he holds the horns of the altar, of the altar he cannot be punished. So here we can say, see an altar made of clay, about uh, two feet high. You can see the asherah, the, the tree, the sacred tree in the front, in the center. And you can see two naked, very poorly made, two naked female figurines, the fertility figurines on both sides, and a very nice goblet, well-painted goblet that was found next to it. So they had some, some rituals related to the production of this apiary. What did they produce in the apiary? Of course, honey and bee wax, which perhaps was even more important than the honey. And in addition to all this, we found next to the APR, in the APR, in fact, this jar. And this jar carried an inscription, one of the 14 inscriptions that we found in this excavation. This inscription says in Paleo Hebrew, that means this is biblical Hebrew, the letters with which the Bible was initially written, written Lamed, La, Nun, Mem, Shin, belonging to Nimshi. That means Nimshi is the owner of this jar, perhaps also the owner of the apiary, because the Nimshi name is interesting. It is known to us from the Book of Kings 
as the name of the father or grandfather of Jehu, King Yehu, the successor of the Omrite dynasty, the one who founded a new dynasty, the, uh, the Nimshite dynasty, uh, which uh, ruled northern Israel for more than 100 years. Jeroboam II was one of the kings in this dynasty. So Nimshi is the father and the grandfather of Yehu. I would say, I would guess that Yehu belonged to this family. So the family of Nimshi, since we found the name here, also in another inscription in the, in the blue level, level uh, 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 later than this one, and also in a site not far from uh, Tel Rehov, uh, you perhaps visited Israel, you know the Sachne, Ganach Losha, the beautiful park. There is a site next to it, and in this site there was another inscription identical to the one that we found belonging to Nimshi. So we have three inscriptions with a Nimshi name in this little area of Rehov and its vicinity. So I think that Nimshi was a major family of, the, of this city, perhaps, the owner of the apiary, and Yehu, the new king, the new dynasty emerged from this important city in northern Israel. All these are things that we did not know until this excavation. So now the question is, why did they build this apiary in the middle of the city and what was the purpose? Okay, uh, I just um, uh, skip a, a little bit. Okay, here, is, here are some, some data about bee keeping and using of, um, of uh, honey and the production of honey. We know that each, uh, uh, I mean, based on ethnographic comparisons, to sum up this, uh, our apiary could produce about half a ton, 500 kilograms of honey, and about 50 to 70 kilograms of bee wax. Now, bee wax is very important because it was used also for metal production. As you know, when you cast metal, bronze, you use bee wax, lost wax method. Um, and uh, I think, I guess, that the metal production needed bee wax and maybe this was a major reason why the apiary was so important to these people. This period, the ninth century, the end of the 10th century is the heyday, the peak of copper production in the Araba Valley. And perhaps some of this copper made its way to the Jordan Valley. It's interesting to hear that Solomon cast the copper objects for the temple in the Jordan Valley. The Bible says, Book of Kings, between Kings, between Sukkot and Saratan. That means about 30 kilometers, about 20 miles south of Tel Rehov. So I think that metal production was very important. We also have evidence for it in the excavation. Now, oh, honey was important. We know the function, the uses of honey. In, the, in Egypt, uh, the uses of beeswax, and you can see this list, I will not read all of it here. Uh, <clears throat> it also is present, it's mentioned in the biblical, in the Egyptian sources as a, a very important product of the land of Canaan. So, uh, but in the Bible, there is no mentioning of, ra of, of raising bees. There are the stories in the book of Judges 14 the Judges, and, Judges and, uh, and, uh, about Jonathan eats uh, honey from the wild honeycombs. Samson eats honey from honeycombs in the lion carcass near Timna. But no apiaries, no, no honey production is mentioned. Now, if you look on Egyptian monuments and wall paintings from the New Kingdom, about 500 years before our earlier to our apiary, you can see similar hives. Look on this, three tiers of cylindrical hives, very similar to ours. And you can see this guy extracting um, a honeycombs from a, a, a hive. And this guy holding a, a vessel with fire flames, yes, to calm down the bees. And we know from ethnographic research in Egypt and in many parts of the Middle East, about similar hives, cylindrical hives. Here is a wall photographed in Egypt 
It includes hundreds of such hives. You can see them here, all over. <clears throat> and this is a picture I took in Lower Galilee in Israel, in an Arab village. You can see hives almost identical to ours. You can see even the, the honeycomb hanging, hanging from uh, uh, the comb here. And this is a picture from Iran, from modern Iran. You can see similar hives to ours. So this type of hive is known in history for thousands of years, until modern era, until it was replaced by the square uh, wooden hives that you know today. This is a big subject, I'm not, uh, I cannot uh, enter into many details. I just want to, uh, to finish this by mentioning the fact that we found the actual bees. In one point, we found dark uh, black material, which was analyzed and proved to be part of <clears throat> honeycomb, charred honeycomb. When we brought it to the Hebrew University laboratories and uh, photographed it with electron microscope, we could see parts of bees. You can see the, the wings, the legs, the muscles. These are the most ancient bees found anywhere in the world, in fact, as far as I know. And they were analyzed, and uh, they were uh, analyzed and uh, identified by three scholars from uh, Germany, from Brazil, and from Israel, is a very specific type of honeybee. The honeybee that it's typical to Turkey, Apis mellifera anatoliaca, Anatol Anatolia, Turkey, which is very different from the local bee that we find in Israel until recent years, before they brought new bees from uh, Italy and uh, Australia and so on. So, the source of our bees is somewhere here in Turkey, about 500 kilometers north of our site, Tel Rehov. How come? Is it evidence for trade? Did they bring bees swarms all the way from there? We don't have any evidence from it, uh, for it from the sources, but we have an interesting parallel from an Assyrian document about 100 years later to our apiary, which mentions bringing bees to a place here in eastern Syria of today, the land of Daesh and Al-Qaeda, uh, from the Zagros Mountains, about 400 kilometers to the north. So we have some parallel to such um, um, uh, trade relations. So perhaps, indeed, they brought um, uh, the, the swarms all the way from Turkey. Who knows? And the reason for all this, as far as I guess, but this is more a guess, is really the need for beeswax for the copper production, copper that was produced in this particular period here in those huge copper mines that were recently excavated, especially by Tom Levy from San Diego University, uh, from uh, University of Los Angeles in San Diego, uh, the copper um, uh, mines at uh, Fainan in Jordan today. But this is more a guess, not, we cannot prove it. Okay, time is now 9.43. Julia, what do you say? Can we speak about the blue city? Yeah, I would say so. We have some time? Yeah, okay. uh, Yeah. let's take another 10 minutes, uh, 10 15 minutes. minutes, and uh, okay, fine. Okay, all right. So if you are not completely bored by this time, so we are moving to the ninth century. The city was rebuilt after a destruction, perhaps an earthquake. It was destroyed, partly destroyed. You look on the area of the apiary. It was completely canceled and rebuilt new buildings on top of the apiary. These buildings existed already in the green city. They were rebuilt now. But what we see now, look on this plan. It's beautiful. We have here a piazza, a small area, open area, another piazza, and buildings arranged around those piazza and streets, very well planned. These four buildings, CQ1, CQ2, CQ3, are identical to each one, very small buildings, each one with three rooms. This building, CF, is larger. It has a large space here and four small chambers on the side, very unusual plan. And the most exciting building is this one, CP. I'll talk about this one and show you a few of the remains. Okay, here we have a isometric view. You can see this building here. <clears throat> Here you can see it from the air, 
after the excavation here, you can see it's all built of mud bricks. And you can see that it has two entrances from a street, which allegedly was here. You enter here and you can enter here. You enter from this room into a large hall and from this room into a large hall. There is a corner room here, a corner room here. And there is a small chamber here, which connects to another chamber here, which connects to this one. So you can move from here to here to here and back or vice versa. Now, in this building and in this area, we found several inscriptions, important ones. The first in this building, CF, again, the name Nimshi appears. Now it appears as part of a louder name belonging to Shakai or something like that, Nimshi. Probably it is a kind of an official, a title of an official serving the family of Nimshi. It was found in this home. And then we have here the inscription Eli Sedek, El Sedek, God is just, El Sedek. We don't have yet any mentioning of a name with the ending Yahu, Yahweh, not yet. And here in this corner, we found this name, Elisha. It is reconstructed, it was not completely preserved, but we read it as Elisha, Elisha, whom you know from the Book of Kings, as the successor of Eliah, a prophet or miracle-making man of very important importance. There are chapters and chapters of stories about Elisha in the Book of Kings. And I'll speak a little bit about this guy, and with this we shall finish. So here is again our building CP. In this building, as I said, we have this inscription, Elisha. You can see it's written in ink, red ink, very large letters, on a pottery shell. Yud, Shin, Ein are very clear. Lamed is broken, and the Aleph have only few remains from the Aleph. So we reconstruct Elisha. It was found in this little chamber here. Now, next to this little chamber, you can see the chamber here. Near this, this chamber had two entrances, one, one from here, one from here. We have here two altars. You can see the altar, one here and the second one here. Two pottery altars. That means this was a very special room, a very special room, unusual. Not only that, in this building, we have a whole group of all kinds of ritual objects, stands and uh, incense burners and the strainers and all kinds of unusual vessels that were found in this building. These boxes with lids are unknown from el el anywhere else. This is an incense burner with a lid. Uh, and a lot of pottery, hundreds of pottery vessels, which show that this building had a very special use. There were benches here along the walls, and I think that perhaps they had some kind of ceremonies here, some kind of banquets. It was not a regular building. And, and, and this fact that they can move from one wing of the building to the other through this little room here. You remember the rabbi of Lubavitch in New York, in Brooklyn? You remember that he used to accept people who came to visit him. There was a line in front of his house in Brooklyn. And one after the other entered his room and got a blessing and one dollar. I compare it to this building. Perhaps my imagination work here, works here too much, but archaeologists need some imagination when they come to interpretation. So I would say perhaps Elisha, who was born, according to the Bible, about 15 kilometers away from this place, in Abel Bet Mechola, and he was involved with the anointment of Jehu, of Jehu, son of Nimshi, as a king. This is told in the Book of Kings. Perhaps by chance we found the place where he visited El Rejo, and we find his inscription here, and all these ceremonies, cultic ceremonies related to this particular person. I wrote it down for the time being, no one hanged me, so I still wait. So uh, you can see here uh, those objects that we saw already, the building, the movement between the rooms, the room where we found the Elisha inscription, and so on.
Now in this building, the other one, CF, again, a lot of unique objects. Look on this, model shrine. Look on this, altar decorated with, with uh, figurines. This is a model shrine with figures of an animal on the roof, some kind of myth, some kind of story, but we don't know, we don't know really what we wanted to describe to illuminate here in this um, interesting um, uh, modeling. Um, and the box, I call it a treasure box, look on the lid. It was found in this room, in this chamber, which is inside this chamber, which is inside this chamber, that means a very well protected room. The building was destroyed, like, like all these buildings, in heavy fire, terrible destruction, which I think, as I told you, caused by Hazael, king of Aram, few years after Gehu came to rise, came to power. So Hazael, the enemy of Israel, destroys the city, it was the home city of Gehu, of the new king. And I think that when he arrived to this place, uh, perhaps there was some looting because we found this box, which is very unusual, upside down uh, in this room with a lid on the floor and it was empty. What was there? We don't know. This was probably an important building because of this inscription belonging to Shakai Minshi, which I mentioned before, and all these cult objects. So we have in this area important, unusual buildings which must be related to elite families of this ninth century, interesting, completely unknown city in northern um, Israel. Here is the altar from this building, CF, which we reconstructed. Um, this figurine was made in the mold. We found the mold in the other building where the Elisha inscription was found. So it's all a very interesting system. Shakai Nimshi inscription, the Eli Tzedek in Shachali inscription. Uh, and we shall end with this a final picture, I think, um, 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 an ivory uh, statuette that we found near these houses. And this ivory statuette shows us a king sitting on his throne. It is very broken. The hands, the head, the legs were made separately and they were not preserved. But we can compare it to this ivory that was found in Samaria, the capital of Israel. This is, ours is sculptured on three dimension. This one is the relief. And it shows a king sitting on his chair, very similar chair, you can see it here. And we have the head, robe, and behind him only the head was preserved of a servant. You can see the servant behind the king, or perhaps one of his ears or whatever. Perhaps we have a similar uh, depiction here, and perhaps it is related to the status of this place, of this city, as the home city of Jehu, the new king of Israel in the mid 9th century BC. Depictions of such kings on thrones are very rare. Here is one from uh, a site next to Jerusalem, 7th century BC, Ramat Rachel, perhaps you know it. And this one was found in an Israelite site in Sinai, in Eastern Sinai, Kuntila Tadrut, again, the king sitting on his chair. These are the only depictions that we have of things from uh, this particular period. Okay, I think with this I'll finish. There are other chapters relating to Tel Rehov, but on this occasion, I think it's time for you to ask questions if you want. Liam? And, uh... <laughs> Ami, uh, Professor Mazal, thank you very much. It was uh, fascinating. Uh, it was just just great, and I wish we had more time. But maybe we will have just another presentation for uh, you know to expand our knowledge. So, but for now, this is uh, this is really amazing, and thank you so much for your time. Uh, we do have a few questions here on chat. So what would you prefer? Would you prefer me to read it for you? Or you can just- Yeah, yeah it's better. Okay. okay, so I will be, okay. So Perhaps it's okay. Julia, is it okay if we go back to not sharing screen? Maybe we can all see yeah. each other. Yes, okay. Uh, I mean, could you please stop sharing so we can see, uh, you know, people and you, speaker? Okay. Okay, all right, okay, here we go, all right. 
So um, let's see. Um, there is a, the first question is regarding the maps you were showing, uh, the uh, biblical maps. Uh, the question is, uh, do these maps, oops, I lost the chat just a minute. Yes. Uh, do these maps come from a specific site? Do these what? Uh, well, the, uh, in the very beginning of the presentation, we, we uh, I think we're still viewing your shared screen. Is that possible? Yeah, yeah it yeah. came back. How yeah. okay. come? I stopped so, sharing. Um, I don't know. Julia, uh, your like... screen? No, I'm not. Uh, oh, we, we are viewing uh, Shirley's uh, screen. I don't uh, think it's mine. No, 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 it's not yours. It's uh, Shirley. Shirley Rogan. Okay. okay. That's it. All right. Now, now we're good. All right. We're all set. So, yeah, we're all set. Okay. So, remember in the very beginning of the presentation, you showed a few maps of uh, uh, the kingdoms uh, as they are described in the Bible? Yes. So, the question yes. is, uh, where do these maps come from? Uh, the first one, the United Monarchy and the Divided Monarchy, was taken from a very old book, John Bright, History of Israel. It's a very famous book because it was used as a textbook in universities for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a map of the Kingdom of uh, David that I took uh, from a small article, a short article in Biblical Archaeology Review, Do you know this journal? Uh, and the article was published by a French scholar, uh, André Lemaire. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, next question is, uh, what caused the split between Israel and Judea? I don't, uh, I, I don't catch this question. What is the question? What, ah, what caused the split? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. this is an historical question. And... Uh, well, so first, you have to realize that there are scholars who don't believe in any split. They don't think there was any united monarchy. Mm -hmm. But uh, a man like myself, who still believe in a united monarchy, must uh, accept the fact that Israel, right from its beginning, was divided between different tribes. As you know, there were 12 tribes. And Judah, Judah and uh, the tribe of Simon, Simon, and Benjamin, and for some time, they, uh, they were the southern group and the other tribes, the northern group. Even in the book of Judges, when you read um, the song of Deborah, Judges chapter uh, four, uh, you, you will see that uh, four or five, the story and the, and the song, uh, she doesn't mention Judah, for example. So the northern tribes acted separately. There were tribal alliances. The United Monarchy, if it was an historical entity, it united all these tribes into one uh, unit, into one state, for a short time, not more than 80 years, according to the Bible, maybe even less, because the chronology of the time of David and Solomon is not very clear, even in the Bible itself. The Bible says 40 years, each one of them, which sounds very schematic. Uh, but right from the beginning, the tribes were separate. Now the Bible says that Jeroboam, in, uh, uh, who was a high official in the northern uh, part of the kingdom of Solomon, he rebelled against uh, the heir of Solomon after his death, Rehoboam, and divided the kingdom. Uh, the reasons for this could be various. I mean, according to the Bible, the Bible says that the reason was that Solomon um, 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 put heavy taxes on the northern tribes, and they rebelled. But we don't really know. We don't really know. The fact is that there were two kingdoms, two states. Uh, we find them in the 8th century. It's very clear. Okay. Um, now, question, uh, what were the geological events that covered up earlier layers of civilization and so allowed building on top to create the levels? Well, these are not geological because we are talking about a very short time in terms of geological terms. You know, when we are talking about geology, we are talking about hundreds of millions of years or millions of years or, or dozens of millions of years. 
the history of these sites that I'm talking about started only about 3,500 years ago. It's nothing. Or Bet She'an, 5,000 BC, let's say, the first initial uh, stages. So we don't have geological features, but we do have earthquakes. This we do have. Uh, the Jordan Valley, in particular, is very sensitive because, you know, we are along the Jordan Valley itself was created by a movement of, you know, the two blocks, the Arab block and the, the, the two uh, geological blocks. And uh, it's still very sensitive area in terms of uh, earthquakes. So earthquakes really um, um, affected uh, our sites. And we think that El Rehov suffered at least twice from destructions due to earthquakes. Okay. But we don't uh, have here any, now, of course, the fact that we have strata, that we have levels one on top of the other, which is the ABC of archeology. span uh, Cities were destroyed in antiquity for many reasons. Human, human hand, you know, conquest, earthquake, uh, abandonment due to uh, dry years or whatever. In many cases, in antiquity, in the Bronze Age and Iron Age, people returned to the same place, and built the city on top of the earlier city. And since they didn't have bulldozers in, this, in those times, they didn't remove the remains of the older city, they built on top of the remains. So we get those layers, a layer above a layer, above a layer, above a layer. Um, Tel Bet Sha'an, as I said, has about 20 layers. Tel Rehov about 20 layers. It can be up to, let's say, 20, 30 meters deep, you know, all these layers. So we are talking about mounds with many levels of occupation. And our task as an archaeologist, dig through these layers, this is not simple. Quite, quite complicated. Yeah. Okay. Uh, where were the wild flowers, which uh, you know uh, feed the bees? Well, we found in the beehives um, a, a lot of dirt, and we gave this dirt to specialists who uh, studied the pollen, you know, the pollen in the earth, and she could analyze and give us a profile of. Of, of plants, the botanical profile of the site in, the, in this period when the apiary was, uh, 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 was operating. And in fact, she found that the profile, the botanical profile is very similar to what we have today. A lot of plants that she identified, we know them today in the Jordan Valley. This valley, Bechan Valley, you can find all kinds of flowers uh, in the springtime, in the summertime. And of course, the bees enjoyed all these flowers. I cannot give you now the list of names. There are yeah. many of them. Okay. Um, um, are these bees uh, still present? Well, I mean, uh, the species, the specific species of bees, are they still around in Israel? And are these bees are in decline today in Israel, just like in US? Okay, two, two important questions. Mm -hmm. The bees that we found, the Anatolian bee, is still the major bee known in Turkey today. It's so good, it's so successful, that today Turkey is a honey producer number three in the world. After I think China and I don't know what is number two. So they have about 80,000 tons of honey every year in Turkey today, due to this particular bee. In Israel, the picture is completely different. We don't know this bee in Israel, not at all. The local bee in the land of Israel, Syria, Jordan, in all our area that we call the Southern Levant, was known as Apis mellifera syriaca, the Syrian bee. The Syrian bee is terrible. First of all, it doesn't give much, doesn't yield much honey. Second, it's very aggressive, stitches, it's really, terrible bee, and therefore the beekeepers in Israel got rid of it. And since uh, 1960 or so, uh, they bring, they brought new species, especially from Italy. Now in Israel, the Italian bee is dominant. Uh, and, uh, but still in the Arab villages, you can still find the Syrian bee here and there. It's not very common. It's very aggressive. 
As to the disappearance of bees, as you know it from the United States, in Israel, it's not so terrible. As far as I know, there is no such a terrible blow to beekeeping as it occurred in the United States. What are the reasons? I don't know. I cannot tell you. All right. Okay. Um, next question will be, uh, can we see such cultic places, same architecture, like many rooms connected one to the other, in other sites in Israel? Oh, it's a good question. The building that we excavated, this building with the Elisha inscription, is unique. There is nothing like it. Of course, we have here and there temples that were found in Israel. Uh, one at Tel Dan, the northern uh, site of Tel Dan, one at Arad, very few. One was excavated recently west of Jerusalem, Mota, but there are very few. We have evidence for household cult. That means clay figurines, cult objects found in houses. Women used to have those fertility figurines at home. In Jerusalem, for example, we have hundreds of those figurines. Uh, when you read the Bible, you think that they worshipped only Yahweh, the one king. But the fact is, archaeology tells us that Israelite religion was much more complicated. Uh, it was not, it still was not completely monotheistic religion uh, by the time of, let's say, the 9th century or the 8th century or even the 7th century BCE. All this period, we have hundreds of clay figurines representing Ashtarte or Asherah, the Canaanite goddess that Israelites worship. Uh, but this special arrangement that we found at Tel Rehov is not known from anywhere else. Will Tel Rehov be open to public uh, one day soon? Any plan? It opened uh, 365 days a year, but you cannot see there much except the site itself, because as you saw, all the architecture was mud brick. Mud bricks are very, very difficult to preserve. In order to preserve mud brick, you have to build a roof above the building, above the remains, as we did in another excavation that I excavated near Tel Aviv, Tel Kassila, it's in the middle of a museum, so we built a roof above it. But in a place like this remote site in the Bechan Valley, we cannot do this. And in fact, we couldn't preserve the buildings, so we just filled our trenches. But when you visit the site today, you don't see much, except the Elisha building, which is covered by special um, preservation material, so you can see the outlines of it. But you can see the site, it's a beautiful site and beautiful view from there. How big is uh, the building we're talking about? Well, uh, this Elisha building is about, mm -hmm. um, I think, uh, 14 meters long by about uh, 8 meters wide. Not very large. It's not a monumental building, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Uh, aren't the small figures behind the seated king relative? In the ivory from Samaria? I'm not sure, Gail. I showed you this uh, black and white picture. Uh, well, Gail, if you're still here, uh, Gail Giacomini, uh, if you're still yes, here, please. Uh, okay. all, all the Egyptian oh, things that I have seen, uh, uh, the uh, small uh, figures uh, are, 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 are... Gail, I think you have to turn off whatever phone. Yeah, I've got, I've got, got my phone on here and it's... Uh, did you turn that off? Yes. yes. There we go. Here we go. Um, um, I don't think it's off. The small figures uh, usually you see in Egyptian paintings are relatives, like they're the sons and daughters and so on, not servants. What made you think this was a, a servant? Well, we don't really know. Uh, the ivory that I showed you, I didn't find it. It was found by the British excavation excavators of Samaria in the 1930s. And uh, it is usually explained as a king sitting on his throne and behind him, he's either servant or high officials. We can, when we look on uh, Assyrian monuments, for example, uh, you can see the king sitting and behind him, officials, high officials or servants, uh, not particularly re uh, relatives. In Egypt, it's something else. We are talking about um, burial, uh, burials, uh, burial caves with wall paintings. That's something we Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. I, okay. I just wanted to mention too, I, I just got a, a, a balm uh, from uh, Israel for treating wounds. It's made from a product uh, that bees make when they are making their hives. So, so that was one of the things that you could use your uh, honey products from or your wax products from. Okay, I showed you a list. I didn't read it all of, of it, of uh, uses of bees and bee wax in Egypt. We know it from the text. And one of them was healing wounds. Mm -hmm. Okay, it yep. was already yeah. known, already known 3,500 3, years ago. Right. So it's and not new. Another use is uh, embalming. Right, you mentioned this. He mentioned uh, both uses. Um, Amy, uh, have you come across Palo Hebrew frequently? That, that's another question we have here. Well, we have inscriptions, of course. I myself excavated few, but we have uh, inscriptions from Israel uh, from the Iron Age, that means the period of the monarchy. Most of them are from the later period, the 8th century, especially the 7th century. We have groups of Ostrakov inscriptions written in ink on pottery shards. They're important. And of course, we have the inscriptions like Siloam inscription in Jerusalem and so on. But they are all later than our site. I'm talking about the 10th and 9th centuries. From these centuries, we have very few. I counted, I think, from all over the country, up to 40 inscriptions. 14 of them came from Tel Rehob. So it's really, really few. This is a time when literacy just began. Okay, well, there is a question. I will uh, rephrase it a little bit uh, because it was sent directly to me, but I would rather have you answering the question. So the question is, um, are these settlements, uh, well, uh, Tel Rehov and, and uh, Tel Bet uh, belong to people that had another religion, uh, not worshiping uh, one God? I mean, not Israelis? In other words, uh, are we sure that the people who had the beehives in uh, Rehov were Israelites worshiping uh, one God? It's a, it's a very good question. I cannot answer you this question because I never interviewed one of the, those people who lived in Tel Rehov in the 9th century BC. Mm -hmm. They died already long ago. So what I can do is only try to learn something from archaeology. And what we know is that, of course, during the Canaanite period, before the Israelites arrived to the land of Israel, uh, they worshipped several gods. We know much about Canaanite religion. Baal, El, El. The word El, which is well known in the Bible, which appears also in the inscription from Tel Rehov, El Tzedek, El was the head of the Canaanite pantheon, like Kronos in, in Greece. Baal was the main god, like Zeus in Greece. And he had wives. One of them was Ashtarte. Another one was Asherah. And another goddess was Anat. All these names are known from the Bible. Now, Yahwism, the worship of one God, of Yahweh, the God of Israel, appeared somewhere, somewhere in the Iron, during the Iron Age. The origins of this God is probably in the south, in the land of Edom. Even the Bible hints to this. Uh, but it started to be important in Israel uh, in a slow process. Again, of course, if you accept the biblical narrative, Moses gave us the law in the, in the Sinai, somewhere in the 13th century, let's say. Then, I mean, this is a tradition which you either accept or not. If you are a religious person, you will accept it. But scholarship uh, shows that this was a, low, a slow process. For example, we don't have in the inscriptions found in Israel any name with the component Yahoo until the 8th century BC. Yahoo, the king of Israel who was born in Tel Rehov, according to my interpretation, he has a Yahwistic name, of course. This is one of the earliest. Uh, so it was a slow process, and I think that a lot of population in these valleys, the valley in the book of Judges, if you remember, I told you, uh, is mentioned as a place where the Canaanites survived. Judges, Judges chapter one. 
So I think a lot of Canaanite population continue to live in these areas all the way. For example, maybe even the Nimshites, the Nimshi family, was perhaps from Canaanite origin. It's very difficult to distinguish exactly who is Israelite and who is Canaanite in this early period. It was a slow process, uh, but eventually all of them identified themselves as Israelites. Definitely by the end of the ninth century, eighth century, they were all identifying themselves as Israelites. But even then, the Bible tells us that they continue to worship Asherah or Ashtoret. The prophets speak against it. That means that it was existing, the worship for other gods. Okay? Excuse me. Can I make a brief comment? Uh, yes. Uh, I went with the volunteers for Israel through Sorel, and we worked on Beit Shan in 1989. We, we also lived, is me. That's right. We lived <laughs> on Kafar. We lived on Kafar Rupin. Yes. The kibbutz that's uh, nearby. Yes, I remember. And we did not work with trowels and brushes. We worked with pickaxes and shovels. We would fill these canvas bags up, large canvas. You remember, huh? We would but was it on the mound or in the Roman city? Excuse me. Yeah, we were in the Roman part. And okay. then, we, uh, then we went across and a stream, and it was Byzantine. Okay, so... If you would work with me on the mound, you will not use much heavy picks and heavy shovels. Because when we dig the biblical period, the archaeology is very different than archaeology of the Roman and Byzantine period. In the Roman Byzantine period, you have these large buildings with a lot of earth fields which you have to dig with heavy tools, so you work so hard. But if you would join me on the upper mound, you would work, work with delicate tools like trowels and brushes, and small peaks. We weren't that fortunate. OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Ami, is it OK to take a few more questions? As you like, I have time. But uh, I mean, a few, moment, few more, okay. few more, few more, few minutes. Okay. A few moments. OK, so uh, a question at the, uh, at the high tail of Beit She'an, where did the water came from? The water. The water must have come from below, from the rivers. We know that the river that we called Asi, uh, this is a river that starts near the Sahne, near the, uh, the Ganesh Losha Park. And in antiquity, it passed at the bottom of the mound. <clears throat> Fresh water, good water. So they had to go down from the mound with jars, fill jars with water, and go up the mountain. It's a heavy task, but they did it. <laughs> well, we, we, uh, we were just shown a photo by Carol Barry Stein, who excavated uh, Beit She'an about, yes. uh, uh, when was it? Um, 1989. 1989. Yeah, but this was not my excavation. It was, it was a Hebrew University and a Israel Antiquities Authority excavation. Yep. Yeah, sure. Today okay, it's a beautiful okay. archaeological park. We were with Yoram Safir. Please? Yoram Safir, yes. Mm -hmm. He passed Yoram away Safir. a few years ago. Yeah. Yoram Safir, yes, definitely. Uh, okay, uh, maybe the last question. Um, dear Professor Mazar, in your opinion, what is the approximate time of the United Kingdom? I cannot guess more than any other history book. If I open classical history books, they would give, uh, they, first of all, most of them use the biblical narrative, which gives each one of these kings 40 years. I must say that for me, those 40 years are very suspicious because when you say 40 years, it's like 40 years in the desert, you know? Um, it's a schematic number. It's, it means that the biblical author did not really know how many years they ruled. So, but if you take 80 years, uh, and if you count from the time when we have some good evidence for the chronology, that, that is the ninth century, the dates of King Ahab are well known to us because they have Assyrian inscriptions, which, cross, which can be cross-referenced with the Bible. If you count the number of years given to each of the kings of Israel, 
from Ahab backwards, you arrive to about 920 to the 925 to the split, to the end of Solomon, okay? So if you add 80 years to this, you are around 1000 BC. But we don't actually know if they ruled 80 years and we don't actually know if they ruled at all. <laughs> so all these questions are, uh, are problematic. We do know the precise years of uh, the kings of Israel from the ninth century onwards, due to these correlations with Assyrian documents. All right. Um, that's it. We ran out of questions. And, okay. Uh, you were an excellent Thank you uh, so much. So much. audience, I must say. And, uh, we will I wish love you well. to hear you again. And just get okay. some vaccina vaccination against this coronavirus. It's terrible. Yeah, we we hope to see all of the wonderful audience we have in reality as soon as possible. And until then, uh, Professor Mazal, I will feel free to invite you to another presentation. And if you will agree to speak to us again, that would be amazing. So, okay, um, we, should speak, we should speak about it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Okay. Just wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Ami. תודה רבה, עמי. תודה רבה. לילה טוב. לילה טוב. Good night. תודה רבה. ג'וליה, uh, did you want to talk about the... תודה רבה. לילה טוב. לילה טוב. אוקיי. Well, that was, uh, that was great. I really enjoyed it. How about Do we, well, have we haven't heard archaeologists for, for a while, so that was, uh, well, I love, um, somebody asked about uh, Tel Rehov, so uh, this place indeed is open like 24-7, and there is totally nothing to see there. I mean, you're welcome to climb up there and to see, uh, to see the surroundings. So without the presentation and without the slides, we'll never understand what is so, you know, what, what is there. For, for people, but okay. So um, thank you for listening again. And before we just say goodbye, uh, I hope to see you all again uh, day after tomorrow. We have a special Tu uh, presentation with a lot of almond trees. And uh, we will be visiting uh, Oshpina, which is a beautiful, um, it, it's just a little bit like Tvat, but not quite. It's, it's a little, uh, Jewish village in the Upper Galilee, uh, which was established twice. Uh, we will be talking about the first Aliyah, and uh, well, so we will be talking about the uh, pioneers, settlers, and Tobishva. And the presentation will be dedicated to Ilana Blumenthal. So, um, <laughs> Exactly, and Ilan and is, is a tree. Well, it will be all explained by Ilan, and you can do that. Uh, were you born in Tubishvat? Ilana, were you no, born in Tubishvat? No. No, no, okay, they no. just love the name. Okay. No, I was born the day the IDF was established, which is cool. That wow. and, and you ended up working for Sorrel. Okay. And the well, same year that, Sar that VFI was founded. <laughs> Same year. Oh, Same wow. Year. Okay. <laughs> well, I know exactly how old you are now. Okay. So, um, so I hope to see you the day after tomorrow for Tubishvat in Roshpina. And then next week, we have a presentation by another professor, and she will be talking about the integration and the challenges for ladies as combat in IDF. So this is something uh, mm. personally I'm looking forward to. And I hope uh, Nama will join us for that as well. And then uh, next week, Thursday uh, tour, we'll be back to uh, Gaza Street Envelope because we didn't really have enough time to see how many beautiful things are there. So we will go back to near mm -hmm. Gaza Street, but we will not be talking about uh, red color alert. We will not be talking about the you know, the, the struggles and, and the missiles, we will be talking about good things only. 